Committee Conversation Panel presented by the Walton Advisory Board. My name is Kim Allman and I am part of this fabulous organization. So if you enjoy this panel today or have a great idea for a panel, we're always looking for those, then make sure that you come on Wednesday at 5, um, every Wednesday, to the Dement Lounge and you are welcome to come join in. You can sit in for one and see how it is or you can come for everyone because it's a ton of fun. So this is going to be really interesting, and I would love to introduce to you our experts over here. We have Dr. Jim Cup, and he is the director of Aubrey Watsik Library and is an instructor at Lewis and Clark College, and Dr. Cup is going to be our moderator for the panel tonight. We also have Graham Kisslingberry, and he has been a community journalist for more than 31 years and has worked in um, various positions for the Cottage Grove Centennial and Albany Democrat Herald. And he is currently an online editor for the Democrat Herald and the Corvallis Gazette Times. Dr. Moving on, Dr. Jack C Crabtree is the director of the McKinsey Study Center. And that is a biblical studies institute of Gutenberg College. And he also teaches there. Dr. T. Wine Hunsicker, what? Oh, sorry. Dr. Wayne Hunsicker, don't know where I got that T from, just adding on to your name, my bad, um, has directed the Eugene LDS Institute since 1999 and teaches many courses. So additionally, I want to thank Barbara Jen Jenkins, for who is the head of the reference light, or who is head of Okay, head reference librarian. And Elizabeth Perkins, the humanities librarian, for composing an annotated bibliography um, of relevant materials for tonight. And you can get that online at the library website, or we should have a um, hard copy here if you'd like to look at that. And if you guys want to, afterwards or someday when you're going through the LLC at the front desk or area, there are some display cases with some cult memorabilia and pictures, and it's a really cool display. So I saw it today, and so you can go do that. And I would love to leave it to the experts now, so enjoy the panel. I guess it's wrong. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Oh, all right. Okay. I'll speak up then. Thank you. Um, Thanks for inviting me here, um, and um, thanks, Kim, for the introductions. As I was walking over across campus, uh, I went to school at the University of Oregon, graduated in 1975, uh, started here in 1970, and uh, I was thinking about cults as I was walking across campus tonight, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in more detail, but there's some personal reminiscences. When I was here, uh, I think the cult that probably most influenced me was the Deadheads. <coughs> uh, you know, if you consider the Deadheads a cult, uh, which you possibly could uh, in some respect. And the year that I, the month that I graduated uh, from here is the, is the month that Pre died uh, in an accident. And uh, Steve Prefontaine, this is ancient history, I realize, but you ought to know who Steve Prefontaine is at Prince Uvo campus. Uh, th there was certainly a cult aspect of, of Pre. Uh, more so, in, in fact, after his death, I think, uh, even before uh, he died. Neither of these are, have religious aspects of them, although I suppose you could say you have a religion of, of uh, Jerry Garcia or something to that effect. Um, but uh, cults are, can be defined in a lot of different ways. And the, the topic, the title of this session tonight is, What is Cult? What is a cult? And I'm here to tell you that there is no definition. <coughs> So you can all go home right now, and we can end the discussion. Uh, th the problem is there are so many definitions of what a cult is. It's really problematic. I'm a utopian scholar, uh, and what does that mean? Well, I study utopian literature. I study utopian communities. I th they're all attempts to establish some type of ideal something uh, or other uh, in that. And uh, there really is no utopia. Thomas More, who gave us coined the word in 1516 when he wrote the book Utopia, was having a play on words. Cult comes from Greek roots, or excuse me, utopia comes from Greek roots, uh, meaning no place. Utopia is a no place. 
but he also might have been coming from Greek roots, meaning good place. So utopia is a good place or a no place. What is it? And as you in the study of utopianism, you can't study utopianism without studying cults because a cult in many, many ways comes up in the same place. Is a cult a good thing or is a cult a no place? And the dark side of all that is, is a cult a bad thing? And, and most, I think, of the connotations that we have when we think about cultism is a negative one. I did, as probably you do, I looked up cult <coughs> in the World Wide Web, uh, did a Google search on cult today. 60 million hits on the word cult. Uh, just kind of shows the dimensions of that. Then I did an interesting search because I did a search on the word Jim Cup with cult. 40,000 hits. None of which had, well, I didn't go through all 40, none of which had any relevance to me. But about, oh, I don't know, six or seven years ago, there was a, a gentleman by this who shared my same name who murdered a physician at an abortion clinic uh, in New York whose name is Jim, and, and, the, and the person whose name, the, the murderer, whose name was Jim Cup, spelled the same way, everything else. And 40, almost most of the citations that I looked at talked about the cultish aspect of Jim Cup as a cult hero to the right wing or uh, conservative aspect of the Catholic Church in, in that respect. So here's another example of, of what a cult is. So it's really hard to, to put your finger on, on what a cult is, and there's so many types of definition. The roots come from Latin words, which means dedication or uh, adoration uh, of something. And that's how it was initially done, was a cult was believers of, of a certain thing. But over the years, it started to uh, migrate into, s into something else and to delve into something else. And I have to go back to, um, I think it's William Penn in 1679, who, um, a quote, and he says, let not every circumstantial difference or variety of cult be nicknamed a new religion. Is a new religion a cult? When does a cult become a religion? When does a religion have a sect that is, is a cult in itself, which I think we're probably going to touch on here I I in some respects. Um, but, but what is a cult? The Oxford English Dictionary, the noun of uh, a cult is a designating cultural phenomena with a strong, often enduring appeal to a relatively small audience. If you get so big, you're not a cult anymore. Uh, designating this appeal or audience or any resultant success, fringe or non-mainstream possibly a fashionable or exclusive cachet. Um, but also, it's a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. And I think that's probably what we think of most often when we think of cult, is something other than what we are. A wonderful, wonderful uh, anonymous quote is a cult is the church down the street from mine. So anything that's not mine is a cult. Uh, overall. It's strange, it's sinister, it's, it's not, it doesn't have the same beliefs that I do. Um, it is there. So th the notion of cold in a broad sense is really hard to track down. But we have examples, and we'll hear some examples this evening, of specific types of cults. In my own study of Oregon utopianism, uh, I've identified nearly 200 intentional communities and communes and, and so forth in the state of Oregon in the last 150 years. Many of these would be considered cults. Uh, some of them very specifically would be considered cults, and we'll, we'll be talking about those some very specifically. But there are things like the followers of uh, Edmund Crefield, Crefield, who was a uh, gentleman in Corvallis, and he thought he was the second Joshua. And basically, he, in, he persuaded young women to more or less audition to be the next mother of God. And they become what was called the Brides of Eden, or the Brides of Christ. And there was this following in Corvallis in the 1901-1902 where these, these believers believed this. And the book, which is on the bibliography, is just a fascinating study. It's called Murder and Madness in Oregon's Love Cult. And uh, it's, it's a really fascinating and a precursor to what we see at Rosh Nishpuram later in uh, the 1980s. But there's all kinds of evidence of these cult types of activities in Oregon throughout, throughout this period, and, and many not far from, from Eugene here. I'm not going to speak too much more on those kinds of things. I just want to kind of lay some of the historic tables of, of what those things are. Um, and we come back to this. We want this to be, we're going to give presentations. Each of the panelists will give some presentations or some thoughts and remarks. But we really want this to be a discussion as it's intended to be. 
uh, with you overall. And Dr. Crabtree is going to kick things off now. Uh, Kevin is going to hand out a, uh, a, a handout that go, will go along with my remarks. As he's doing that, let, let me just begin with giving you my perspective. I think it's only fair that you know where I'm coming from. I consider myself a radical biblicist, and what I mean by that is I know no other authority than the Bible itself. And that, that certainly puts me in a minority uh, view. The ultimate authority for me is reason. Um, given that the ultimate authority is reason, I've, I come through philosophical reflection and through biblical studies to three important conclusions, the least important for tonight's purposes, that God exists, that Jesus was the one sent by God to reveal his truth to mankind, and that the teaching of the Bible accurately reflects Jesus' teaching. So, because I believe that the teaching of the Bible accurately reflects Jesus' teaching, who is the one sent by God, then the only external authority for me is the Bible itself. I'm, I'm in a different position than most Christian traditions, because most Christian traditions give some sort of either stated or de facto authority to some kind of creed or doctrinal statement or something of the sort that they consider to be reliable or inerrant or authoritative or something. Uh, I, I don't. I, I believe that I can get things wrong in my study of the Bible and in my life it's going to be a lifetime process of studying the Bible and correcting when I've made mistakes and adjusting my viewpoint, my worldview accordingly. So that's, that's where I'm coming from, and it's from that perspective that I make my remarks. Um, I, I certainly agree with Jim that to define a cult is virtually impossible and find any kind of consensus on how you would define a cult. But there's two definitions that I think are important in my experience, and those, those are the two that I want to talk about here. There's the concept of cult that's a, a tool of moral and spiritual discernment, um, that's a concept used as a tool to make a moral value judgment about a particular religious group. And, and when you use the term cult, that concept in that particular way, then I would define a cult as a group of people whose beliefs, behaviors, and lives are controlled through either physical coercion or psychological and emotional manipulation. So that, that's one, I think, helpful understanding of the word cult that I would use. There's another concept, however, the second one on my list, the concept of cult as it's use, used as a tool of social coercion. It's a concept used as a tool to coerce doctrinal or behavioral conformity. In that sense, you know, there's two definitions you could give. A cult is a group that embraces beliefs that are unorthodox. So any group that, em that embraces beliefs that my group considers to be un unorthodox could be a cult. Or it's a cult is a group that embraces odd, albeit not unorthodox beliefs, but odd beliefs, and whose odd minority nonconformist beliefs lead them to engage in practices that are out of conformity to the majority culture. Now I want to I want to take those if you on the back of your page, look at each of those definitions in the reverse order, definition two first, and just make a couple of comments about them. With respect to the, defi the second definition, where uh, the concept of cult is used as a tool of social coercion, that's a destructive use of the concept cult, I would argue, even though it, it gets used widely that way by, by all kinds of, of evangelical Christian groups, for example, that would probably most identify with me. Uh, that's a very destructive use of the concept, it seems to me. It's used to bully other people into submission. It's fundamentally an immoral use of the concept, I believe. Uh, the threat of being labeled a cult is an attempt to coerce conformity with respect to doctrine or practice or both. It, that use appeals to our xenophobic impulses, I think, so it's, it's very human to do this, but nonetheless, I think it's ultimately immoral. The function of the label cult by this definition, its function is to marginalize and delegitimize those groups that the majority religious culture is threatened by. And often they're threatened by them because they're perceived to be competing with them for, for members or power or uh, influence. The first definition, the, the one that I think is a legitimate use of the term because it's, it's making a, a legitimate moral value judgment, 
It's positive and constructive. I think it's the only morally legitimate use of the concept. From a biblical perspective, the perspective that I'm coming from, belief arrived at by way of free, responsible, rational, personal choice is the only authentic faith. There's all kinds of ways to come to belief, but the only kind of belief that's authentic is one that I have freely come to responsibly, rationally, and personally. Anything else, any coerced belief, for example, is ultimately inauthentic and illegitimate. Therefore, to draw the line between communities based on a morally legitimate belief and communities based on illegitimate belief, I think is a good, right, and just and valid thing to do. Cults under this definition are destructive as well as invalid. They do not respect the humanity of their members. Manipulation, as, as the philosopher Immanuel Kant was uh, emphasized, that if, that if we're not making this choice autonomously, autonomously then we, our humanity is, is not, uh, not in gear. Um, I would argue that every religious community without exception, because the tendency of human beings is such, every religious community without exception will tend toward being a cult in this sense. Every religious community to one degree or another uses forms of coercion to try to bring conformity among its members. So I think they all tend toward cult by this definition. Some groups that are popularly perceived to not be cults, and, and usually by uh, the second definition, by the second definition they're not considered cults, popularly speaking, but some groups that are popularly perceived not to be cults are by this definition, definition one of cult, more cult-like than some of the groups that are popularly perceived to be cults, I would argue. So being a cult by this definition will be a matter of degree, I think, in three respects. Some, uh, sometimes the religious groups are only mildly cultic, but it's going to be a matter of degree in three respects. A matter of degree with respect to the scope of the coercion, how much of their life is coerced by the cult, with respect to the degree of intensity of the coercion, how much pressure is put on people to conform, and then finally, a matter of degree with respect to how perverse, self-destructive, and antisocial are the behaviors that the group is coerced into practicing. And I think we typically think of cults as, as only those where the behaviors that they're coerced into practicing are pretty extreme in terms of the self-destructive nature of the practices and the antisocial nature of the practices. But the dynamic is the same, whether it goes to that level of, of uh, perversity or not, the level, uh, the, the dynamic is the same, even in mainstream denominations where these cult-like forces are at work within the community to, to bring about conformity. That's all for now. We'll do is we'll have each uh, person present, and then we'll open up for broader, broader discussions uh, at, at that point in time. I just have to make one remark. I the course I'm teaching this semester is called Exploring Eden, and I think we need to have Jack come and talk to us about <laughs> <laughs> about that, uh, <coughs> looking at <coughs> the concept of Eden, excuse me, <coughs> in the broadest possible uh, possible way. Yeah, I think you're up. All right. <coughs> well, I appreciate being here. Uh, I represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and was specifically invited, I, I can only assume, because somebody considers us to be a cult. Um, and, you know, I guess I'm not offended by that. Um, I suppose that you can, as you have said, you can put a positive or a negative connotation to the concept of cult. Um, I guess I've never thought of my faith as being cult uh, or cultish um, and so it is a little strange for me to be sitting here um, representing cults um, and so uh, I have to say that at the beginning that uh, you know that's that's kind of an interesting feeling now w the definition of cults you know I, I guess I <coughs> please excuse me I don't care what the definition of a cult is. And I 
don't care if people call us a cult. What I care is what I feel in my heart. And I appreciate what you said about uh, being able to reason and have rational uh, thought about where I am and why I'm here in my position in my life. And, and I have to say that that's one of the things that I agree with you 100% is that I believe people have to make their own choices. And in my faith, uh, that's a basic tenet is that we believe everybody has to come to their own spiritual, reasoned, uh, rational uh, point of view. So the concept of whether you want to uh, call us that or I'm, I'm going to skip right over that part. And if you want to ask questions about that, that I'd be happy to answer those. What I do want to talk about is uh, that in, in the in information that was given to me, there were a lot of other things that they asked me to talk about. And they wanted to know about uh, a book by John Krakauer, uh, under the Banner of Heaven, A Story of Violent Faith, which is supposedly uh, supposed to represent my faith. And uh, they wanted to know about Warren Jeffs, who I think most of you have seen on TV, and does he reflect my faith? Uh, they wanted to know about uh, other groups, and, and I must say that there are probably, oh, I would say in excess of 100 breakoffs from my church. Uh, and so I have to say this just right up front. I'm not responsible for what they do. I'm not responsible, and our church isn't responsible. They have their agency to go off, and, and some of them are, by my standards, unusual. Um, we could go further, but they're unusual at the least. Some of them I have to admire because of their, they, their piety, I guess you'd say. They seem to believe very deeply in what they believe. I do not agree with them. And so uh, I just have to say that. Now let me just say Warren Jeffs and the fundamentalists. Uh, I actually know a little bit about this one. Uh, I will admit to you that I have a distant relative who is a part of that group. And we've had interesting discussions, and so I can tell you, not firsthand, but I can tell you secondhand, that uh, I have been down there, and I know that he was on the 10 Most Wanted, which I absolutely laughed at, in terms of they thought he would be violent. When he was captured, he had a lot of money, but no guns, and uh, that's the way they are. There's no violence uh, to them. They are and they have awfully interesting beliefs about having more than one wife. And uh, they have a lot of other interesting beliefs as well. But they left our church a hundred and some years ago and have been doing their own thing. And I guess I'd have to say at what point, you know, am I responsible for their beliefs? And yet every commentator Every news person puts the two of us and compares the two that somehow we're related. Only in that, uh, well, as I guess in the same way that if you're a Protestant that you're related to the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is here and all these broke off from the Catholic <laughs> Church. So in that sense, everybody who uh, is a Presbyterian or a Lutheran reflects on the Catholic Church in the same way. So, um, I guess I have to say that. Uh, I, I want you to know that if you practice plural marriage in my church since 1890, which is, what, 116 years ago, you're excommunicated from the church just about as quick as it's possible to be excommunicated. Does that make sense? That's, that's very clear in our church. Um, the second thing I just want to talk about under the banner of heaven by John Crack. Gower. Um, I understand he wrote two really fine books about climbing Mount Everest and, and uh, climbing, and he did a wonderful job on those books. However, 
<clears throat> if, uh, if he put the same amount of effort into being historically correct in those that he did in this book, I would have to question the other books because that book about my faith would be such that I would find it difficult to even recognize my faith based on what he said. It is what he basically has done is find every aberration of our faith and, and then generalize that to our faith. So that would be the equivalent of saying that we could understand Germans today by studying Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf or we could understand American culture if we, if we studied, uh, um, gosh, his name just went out of my head. Uh, blew up the, build it, the Murrow building. Tim McVeigh, Tim McVeigh. So in, in that sense, he looked for all these people who were weird and then said, okay, they must be weird because of the church. What's interesting that all these people who were members of the church had been excommunicated from the church. They weren't members of the church when they did those things. So I, I could be more specific uh, about that, um, and I can if you want me to be. You just ask me, and I can give you more specifics. Um, the church today is very, uh, is growing tremendously. Um, when I was your age, there were two and a half million members of the church. Today there are 13 million. Um, we are growing uh, in every country that we're allowed to be in. Um, and I think I would say most of you know a Mormon. And I think you should ask yourself, uh, um, is that person uh, really an odd person or are they a good person? Uh, most, I think you'll find most Mormons are law-abiding, honest, sincere, uh, trying to do what's right. They believe in Jesus Christ. They accept him as their savior. We, we, uh, we believe that uh, it is only through him that we will gain salvation. Now, well, I think I'll sort of in there <clears throat> I I feel I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna comment a little bit um, I, guess, I guess I can do that as moderator I can do anything I want I'm the moderator <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got the umbrella oh wait you all got umbrellas. Um, I mean these are both interesting perspectives and, and in, in my studies in utopianism and so forth when we get to uh, some of the individuals and look at at various groups that have sought Eden um, and and in returning to Eden which is getting to heaven, getting to salvation. That's that's the concept that's behind a lot of, of, of cults in the religious sense. Is that is returning to that. Even Heaven's Gate, which is again probably ancient history. I mean, <laughs> to you folks, but but it's a cult who who thought that they uh, you know the salvation was coming behind a comet in, in the form of a flying saucer um, kind of a thing uh, back in the early 90s, and they committed um, a suicide, which is unfortunately. Uh, the end result, which we'll hear more about uh, in a minute. But they're getting to salvation. You look at these kinds of things, but in, in the courses I teach and the things that I write and, and, and look at, um, I, I go back to um, the person that both these gentlemen have referenced, Jesus Christ. And is Jesus was Jesus Christ a cult um, in, in, in that time frame? And it, you, have to, you have to look at that. And you would have to, by a lot of definitions, say because of how the other people were looking at them, Here's a person who was crucified because their beliefs were strange and different and everything else of that. They would have to be looked at as, as cultish at that time. But in the 2,000 plus years um, since that time, they, you know, we have a different perspective on that. But in the same reflection, in the classes I teach, we look at Joseph Smith and the rise of uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 1820s and, and when the Book of Mormon started and, and sort of that as a cultish type of experience of how people related to them. But as Wayne has suggested, uh, the Mormon church is the fastest growing religion in the world right now in terms of percentages and, and, and growth. 
and you know, that's a 180 year experience as opposed to a 2000 year experience. So where, where, do the, where do these cultish kinds of things lead and how long does it take to get that kind of acceptance? 180 years after Jesus Christ, I suspect there was still a lot of people saying, you know, oh, you know, let's persecute them, which did indeed happen <laughs> uh, quite a few of the time because they were still looked at, at coldly. So we have to, I think, put some perspective on, on, on those particular things. But there are also then a variety of other kinds of, uh, of cults, and um, we're going to hear now <laughs> of one of the most notorious ones of the 20th century uh, <laughs> in, in many respects. Uh, well, I'm not going to say any more and let you take it from there. I was at work last Thursday night uh, in Albany posting stories for the Gazette Times on the web and the sports, one of our sports part-timers who was taking phone calls, OSU student, we were talking, I said, I'm coming down. We, we got talking about the ducks and the beavers. That's a whole other cult issue, I guess. <laughs> um, and, um, and I said, I'm going to give a talk on, I'm going to talk about Jonestown. And he said, what's Jonestown? How many of you, and I just be honest, have never heard of Jonestown? Just raise your hands. Thank you. I'll, s I'll just start it by saying it was an ugly bit of history, a little blip in history, 28 years ago. And my sister was involved. It was, the group was called the People's Temple. Now, we've heard tonight, and, and I went through this. Um, I talked for years, uh, in, from about 1981 to 1987. I talked until I was blue about cults. I tried to get my arms around the definition, and it wasn't easy. There are some marks of cults that certainly characterized the people's temple. And we've heard the word destructive cult. This was certainly a destructive, destructive cult. This was a slam dunk cult. A cult is usually character, and, and, and this was out of a pamphlet. I pulled this out of a little brown box I have. I used to give these talks. I was part of the counter cult movement, and I gave talks. I didn't go out and kidnap people or anything like that. Um, because what was happen it happened to my sister, I worried about people your age, where things like deception, fraud, exploitation, abuse, and even violence and murder groups that use these sorts of things. They don't have to be religious, they can be secular. Whenever the leadership at the top is fouled up, everything below it's gonna be fouled up. And this is what happened in the People's Temple. Cult is usually characterized by a leader who claims uh, divinity or a special relationship with God. And, and these were d definitions back in the 80s, and they may seem a little passe now, so, but they applied to some of the groups, Rajneesh, um, and some of the others, but the People's Temple in particular. The leader or founders demand absolute and unquestioning obedience and are the sole judges of the member's faith commitment. Members are preoccupied with fundraising, recruiting, and worship exercises. In Christmas of 1977, was my sister was there. We were in Burlingame, California. We were all together, and there was a knock on the door, and the people from the temple were there, and off she went, and that was the last time I saw her. Meaningful communication with family is sharply curtailed, and the cult becomes the convert's new family. Absolutely happened then. Members put goals of the cults ahead of individual concerns, interests, educational plans, or career goals. Cults utilize sophisticated techniques designed to affect ego destruction, thought reform, and dependence on the cult. Members may be guarded, vague, or secretive about beliefs, goals, demands, and activities until one is hooked. The cult may, main, may maintain members in a state of heightened suggestibility through changes in sleep and diet, intense spiritual exercises, constant indoctrination, and controlled group experiences. It, it's a, I'm not talking about all different sorts of groups, but destructive cults. My daughter Lisa, who helped organize this tonight, said, Dad, would you bring the page you wrote about, these are my sister's letters from Jonestown. And this was 1998. This was the 20th anniversary of a tragic event in which there was a horrible murder-suicide in Jonestown, Guyana, named after this man. And I'm going to read just a little bit, not from her letters, but from the column I wrote trying to interpret this. I always, th <coughs> I always tell my daughters how much fun they <coughs> This is my sister. This was taken in Jonestown, Guyana on October 16th, 
1978, one month before the murder-suicide. I always tell my daughters how much fun they would have had with their Aunt Sharon if she were alive today. Sharon loved art, and so do my kids. If Sharon were around, they'd all be drying, or they'd be making a mess tie-dyeing something. <laughs> Sharon would have turned 50 last October. We all believe she would have become a social worker looking for, out for people was her forte, and Sharon probably would have had a bunch of kids of her own today. Would have, could have, should have, and those are words I've been saying for 28 years because she's gone, and she died at age 22. The letters that were, we printed on this page painted a glowing picture of what was going on down there. You know, everything was just, I, just ideal. There was nothing wrong. Beautiful, they were fed well, and it was just this dreamy thing. My mother, Dorothy, put it best. The letters read like a script. Those were not the words of your sister, she said. They just told her what to do, and they did. They censored. The one thing that came through in the letters, and I don't have them here, and when I went looking for them, I don't know where they are right now. They're stuffed somewhere. When you do your archiving, thank God we're in the digital age because all these papers shoved in boxes in attics, it, it's not good. You know? <laughs> I'm glad we have MP3 players and everybody has iPods now. Anyway, um, what did come through was her personality in those letters, her little cursive flair and and, and, and that you can't, nobody can control that. And I'm sure she did things she wrote about, such as working in a piggery. She loved animals, always had animals around. What's not found in her letters is any mention of the man whom Sharon placed her faith, Jim Jones, the People's Temple founder and Jonestown namesake. It was in 1975 that Sharon first heard about the People's Temple. How did people get drawn into these groups? There were friends in the neighborhood that were going up to San Francisco in the Redwood Valley where he had, he first started out in Indianapolis, then moved the group to the Redwood Valley of California, supposedly a place that if we had nuclear holocaust, it would be a safe haven. But it was a little too remote for him and they start ma making these forays into places including Portland and San Francisco and he eventually bought a, uh, a what used to be a synagogue, and they called that the People's Temple, and they moved the whole operation to San Francisco. He was a charismatic leader, and I've heard this from many people, and he was a manipulator. He, he spoke against racism, injustice, and inequality, something in my family, and, and Sharon and I really believed in, but she took the wrong path with this guy. He became very influential in San Francisco. He, he was appointed to the Housing Commission. My sister loved Joan's message and many acts of caring the People's Temple showed for people in need. Not long after joining the temple, Sharon moved to San Francisco, and this happened in this group. She gave everything, she worked at a bank, and everything she earned went to the temple. So, senior citizens, all their social security checks. So when they wanted to get this agricultural uh, project going in Guyana, Jonestown, they had millions of dollars and, and able to buy heavy equipment and turn a, a, a piece of jungle into this agricultural project. Not long after, uh, let's see, she told me about all the wonderful things the te temple did, want, wanted me to go to the services. Oh, they heal people. Well, the healings were nothing but sleight of hand. They'd take chicken livers and things like that, and you know, supposedly people would be spitting up cancers. And, and, but, but again, a charismatic leader, a manipulator, and he was able to, to, to convince people. In August 1977, New West Magazine, and this is not the particular issue, came out with a, an investigative piece of allegations of abuse and violence within the temple. Long before, or right before this happened, Jones was gone, had moved to uh, the, the um, Jonestown, and many, most of the, the members uh, went with him. We have a picture here. This I mentioned the last Christmas, and that we have one here just taken minutes before she got, we got that knock on the door. Sharon, my sister Linda, and I uh, 
uh, okay, yeah, I mentioned that. My mother uh, thinks Sharon wasn't allowed to go to Jonestown earlier. She did not go <laughs> at that point for one reason. People's Temple leaders feared my father's access to the media and politicians he knew through his public relations and advertising business in Sac San Francisco. My dad never, and this was one thing that's very important, if you ever have somebody that gets hooked up in something and you think it's, it's troublesome, he did, he was very cool. He wrote her every week. He talked about the good things, working in the piggery and the nursery that she talked about, supported her. While privately, he found out everything he could. And he went to his congressman, Leo Ryan, with his concerns. He was a congressman from San Mateo County. Leo Ryan's son was in my sister's high school class at Mills High School. Leo Ryan's daughter, Pat, was my age. His older daughter, Shannon, was there. The 50, Ryan, who was then 53, the age I am now, decided on, in mid-November of 1978 to go down and investigate the things that were happening. He had a nephew who was involved in another group, a cult at the time, and he, d he was very interested in what his constituents were telling him. So on November 17, 1978, Ryan and his party of concerned relatives and newsmen were treated to a feast. And, and before I, I, let me preface this by saying, before he, um, they arrive in Jonestown, Jones is very ill at this point. He has picked up something down there and he's, and, and he's taking prescription drugs that he's abusing and he's just, he's becoming mad. And his son sees it and others sees it, others see it. And, and any defection from this organization is considered heresy. And they would take people, they would gather in this pavilion, and they would take people uh, and just berate them, humiliate them. And imagine you've got 900 people, and you're being humiliated because you want to go home, or you've taken a banana or something like that. And, he'd, and when somebody did defect and leave, he would hold these white knights. And they'd gather in the pavilion, and they'd pretend they were going to uh, commit suicide together. They'd take a drink and he'd say it was poison and it w actually wasn't, a sugar-flavored sugar drink. It was like a loyalty test. And I want to play for you one minute uh, of, is that Mike nearby? Okay. One minute of Jones during one of these white nights where he's telling them that he should have had them hate a little bit more and love a little bit less. Love has practically caused me to just get you destroyed. If I had hated a little more, just a little more, we would have had a little less trouble. Because I look at my faults analytically. Sure, you got love, principle, but don't say, hate is my enemy. What did it say? What's that word? Hate is my enemy. I got to fight it day and night. What else up there? There's a line. Love is the only weapon. Shit! Bullshit! Martin Luther King died with love. Kennedy died talking about something he couldn't even understand, some kind of generalized love, and he never even backed it up. He shot down. Bullshit. Love is the only weapon with which I got to fight. I got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight. I got my claws. I got compasses. I got guns. I got dynamite. I got a hell of a lot to fight. I'll fight. They know we mean it. We'll kill them if they come. Well, they came. 
It was just Leo Ryan, his aide, some newsmen, and some concerned relatives. They all couldn't make it in. They had to fly into what was called Port Kaituma, about six miles away, and then it was a flatbed truck ride into Jonestown. And it was very festive that night. They really put on, like, they were not fed well there, as my sister said in the letters. It, you know, rice was the basic, it. but when somebody like Leo Ryan came in, they would find the food, they would go and put on a big show. And everything, and there were speeches, and everybody was happy and so forth. But then people started handing notes to Ryan saying, I want to get out of here. I want to go home. By the next day, he had 16 people. And by the next day afternoon, he was attacked. Ryan was attacked. And the guy came at him with a knife. Unfortunately, he didn't succeed, but there was blood all over Ryan. And it was time for them to leave. They left with 16 relatives. And they, they took the um, truck back to Port Kaituma. They were ready to board the planes. And some of them were already on the planes. And some temple people came up in vehicles and they started opening fire. They killed Leo Ryan. They killed four other people. They injured 11, including Tim Reiterman, the author of this book, uh, San Francisco Examiner reporter and a wonderful guy. He now works for the LA Times. And he spent four years writing this book. When the word got back to Jones, he, who had already assembled the people for another white night, and this is about 6 o'clock in the afternoon of November 18, 1978, the final solution then came. He, he decided that they would actually commit suicide. And so he gathered them, and they put together this, um, this brew. It's too late, he replied, when asked that, if that they couldn't consider an alternative, and he urged them to come forward for their last drink. Along one side of the building on a wooden table was a vat with the potion. And this is the potion. Grape Flavor Aid. And if you've ever had or heard that it was Kool Aid, it was not. It was something called Flavor Aid. Colored it purplish. Potassium cyanide was the poison. Liquid, liquid Valium and other drugs stood alongside it in vials. The great doc the doctor of their medical staff that, that helped save babies and did a lot of good work down there before was now supervising about a dozen members of the Jonestown medical staff. Hypodermic ne needles were filled. Potion was poured in paper cups from metal and plastic tubes. Large syringes and small squeeze bottles were loaded. Around the pavilion, security people and some who returned from the airstrip patrolled with guns. No one was to run. No one would pass alive. And Jones, throughout this, was on, on, on the microphone. Take our lives from us. We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide, protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. The cries of children rose as a haunting counterpoint. The sequence of death would be children, young adults, adults, the elderly, such a clever way to make all sure died. What would the adults have to live for after they watched the next generations die? On that horrible Saturday, no one save Christine Miller. Christine Miller got up beforehand and said, you don't need to do this. You don't, and, and she actually took him on verbally, and then she was shouted down. We do know from the tapes that many people resisted, but they were, they, it was shot into their arms. They squeezed it into the children's throats. No one save Christine Miller took on Jones, 
No one kicked over the vat of poison or turned guns on their leader to stop him. No one could stop him, not after he had manipulated his people into believing their fortunes lay only in a grandiose final statement. Not after he had sealed their compact with the airstrip murders and the command, bring the children first. The executioner had initiated an act of such enormity and tragedy that Jonestown, the life-sustaining symbol and dream for his followers, would become a degraded international synonym for unspeakable evil and waste. The worldwide perception alone would prove the last gesture of a failure, Jones's closing act of fraud. My sister and 911 other people died from the poisoning. The 47-year-old Jones died from a bullet to the head. He didn't take it. He had the children take it, but he did not take it. Did Sharon take the poison willingly? Did she resist? Did she attempt to save the baby she once helped in the nursery? I'm still asking those questions 20 years later. Among, in that little box, I've got a sermon written by Tom Gillespie. He was the minister at the Presbyterian Church that we attended when we were teens. And he just retired last year after a long stint as president of Princeton Theological Seminary. And he said this, life is a struggle for faith, for the ultimate meaning of our lives. And those who pursue it with passion, like the members of the People's Temple who died in Jonestown, may not be dismissed as irrational or denounced as fanatics. In their zeal, we must recognize what the Wall Street Journal calls the profoundness of the human will to believe, the longing for certainty of faith. And that is the challenge to us all. It is also a warning against the worship of false gods. For as the Old and New Testaments never tire of telling us, we do become the slaves of the powers we serve. In the worship of idols, there is only death. So let us neither dismiss nor denounce those who died at Jonestown. Let us rather heed the warning of their death and respond to the challenge of their lives. Thank you. I think we should uh, open up for discussion. We have about a half hour left and questions um, and so forth. I think one of the things that came, came out um, of the last presentation, obviously, is the emotion, but the psychological aspects of, of all this and how they, how they relate to cults. I mean, why do people um, you know, follow these, these charismatic leaders in the, in the way that they do? And there's, there's multitudes of, of examples throughout uh, American history, but around the world in terms of why they do these things. Um, that's, that's long been that. And, and then even when they get to the point of the coerced belief or the threatening uh, and all that, that just it's another th aspect of that. We, I donated to the University of Oregon Library uh, a couple of the People Temple's pamphlets from the early days when, you know, they're all, the PR aspect of what they do is, you know, makes it look really, really very, very positive in, in the kinds of things that they do. And they, and they, they bring people in to, to do that. And the thing was, they did positive things. They did a lot, but for all the good, there was always the malevolence of the leader. You know, I mean, he, every kind of abuse imaginable, including sexual, sexual abuse performed by none other than Jim, Jim Jones. You know, it's Let's hear from you. Questions, comments? Chris, you could help us tonight, maybe by briefly repeating some questions. Or sure. Actually, I'll have to start. I, I'm a Simpson fanatic, and there's a, there's a, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a there's this episode of The Simpsons where it, where it really takes on uh, cultism, and uh, the the leader, and I and my class does this. They they know they've heard these stories before, but uh, Homer, who is hard of the, one of the, I mean, you can't even coerce him to believe anything. Uh, is everybody in Springfield is is captured by this charismatic leader, uh, who is called the leader, and. They uh, uh, can never get Homer to, to finally come over, and they finally figure out that he adores the um, Batman song. Da 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 Batman, da 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 Batman. So finally, the cult uh, starts 
changes their song to da 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 leader, da 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 leader, and that's how um, that's how they finally get Homer. So in my classes, um, whenever we start t talking about cults, the, the class always breaks into da 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 da, -da leader. So anyway, <laughs> I had to throw a little light moment in there because I thought we needed to break that up. Questions, comments. Why is it that time is able to change that and that they're not technically still cults, just followed by many people? Like, as I was listening to your sister's story, and I was thinking, because my stepmom was Mormon before she was excommunicated, um, she wasn't excommunicated, but when her crack addicted husband wouldn't go to get help, and she asked the church for help, and she said she wanted a divorce. They told her that it was her fault. She should have been a better woman. And she stopped going there. Um, so one of my questions, though, is does Jim Jones, Jesus, and Joseph Smith all have this central character in common? No. Jim Jones, uh, from what I've read about Jesus, I, I, I don't think he used deception, fraud, and exploitation and abuse uh, and violence uh, in his ministry. The, the words and the teachings were, were different from that day. And in that sense, maybe they considered it cultic, but it, I, I'm talking about a different sort of thing where they're destroying people. I think just to repeat, I think the nature of the question here, uh, which was what I was asked to do, uh, what would Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, um, and Jim Jones have in common that, that would do that? First, and, and you know, were, they, were those other were, were the Christians, early Christians, the early uh, uh, Mormons, cults? Th they certainly wouldn't have thought themselves that way. Uh, I mean, the same way that you, no utopian, there's no utopian group calls themselves utopian. That's a, that, that's a tag we put onto them later on in what they do. But if you look at them as being separatist, as, as believing something that's out of the mainstream of, of, of what goes on, that's probably how they would be defined in that fashion. I, I certainly agree that Jim Jones uh, is hard to stack up against Jesus Christ and, and Joseph Smith, but there are certain people who in uh, Jerusalem in that time frame might have thought that he was using coercive types of tactics in, in, in doing types of things, the same way that, that people, I mean, Joseph Smith was not crucified, but he was essentially uh, killed for his beliefs and the things that he did. Uh, but what, they, what the common thing that they had, not themselves, they had people who believed in what they did. And the thing that I thought that they all had in common was, um, yes, the Jim Jones, his, his end was different than theirs, but it seemed that at the beginning he preached a better life. Like, that's why people went to him. Just like Jesus and Joseph Smith all had teachings that were supposed to lead to a better life. And it also, the deception that you talked about, it could have been there. It's, it depends on, in my opinion, on who you talk to. But if you talk to a non-religious person today and some random person was to say, oh, look, I am the son of an almighty deity. I have the power to heal people. Everybody would laugh in their face. And it kind of goes that that could have been a little bit of deception. They all are connected by these claims that are supernatural and, in my opinion, outrageous. Okay. I can only speak to, you know, Jim Jones early on, like in his, in his ministry, he became meg megalomaniac would be the word I, I would use to, you know, he, he became obsessed with his own power. I mean, it just, I am God, you know, I... <laughs> It's not, not just I, I am an instrument of God, I, and, and that's, and we're talking back into Indianapolis and earlier. Even as a child, he was a, he had some real malevolent behavior that, that never stopped. And, you know, it's for all this good, they, they did good things. Um, there, there was a, here's a comparison guy in San Francisco. They were almost like, rivals, but they did the same thing. They were standing for the same thing. And one, one was Cecil Williams, 
of Glide Memorial Methodist Church. Anybody, any of you seen the movie uh, Pursuit of Happiness? Okay, Glide Memorial Methodist Church is very prominent there. Chris Gardner was asked the question, uh, do you feel you have to give back? He says, I don't give back, I give, and I give to Glide. And Glide was doing the same kind of ministries. Glide is still doing that today. Both had big egos, and, uh, but, but there was something grounded in Glide and still is. They have, they have the structures in place. Part of the responsibility of any organization is to its people, ensure their safety, ensure that the, the organization is going to grow in a good way. And, and when it's fouled up at the top like it was with Jones, everything gets, can get screwed up. They don't accept it as a church thing that happened and still goes on, but they still talk about electroshock therapy to cure, cure people from homosexuality. These what? are malevolent things also, or the whole history of the Crusades for the Christians and the Catholics. It, they all have histories of violence, histories of supernatural outrageous claims, histories of somebody saying, I am the way to your salvation. Well, my answer to that is, you know, when you're searching in your own spirituality and your own, you, you look at, you know, uh, people in their 20s don't generally, um, it's not the biggest church age. You know, I, I remember that from being here myself. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you go to church every week. Or, but when you do search for, at some point you may, you know, at some point you may want to be part of a church or a synagogue or or some kind of faith um, community. And when you look at that, look at how it is grounded. You know, are they doing the sorts of things that you're talking about? You don't want to be part of that. You know, it's people that make, the, 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 that help these organizations succeed, and, and it takes a, a lot of hard work, and you've got to have a lot of good structures in place. This is part of what Wayne was saying, but you have, you have to judge a belief system not by what supposed adherents of that belief system do, but judge the belief system on its own merits. Y within any belief system, you're going to have people who don't follow it, who, who engage in practices that are actually contradicted by the belief system, and you certainly can't blame the belief system for people who aren't practicing it and yet have, are somehow identifying with it. Or, or practicing an abhorrent version of it or s in some way. And I don't know where you've, I have never even heard that before. So. I don't know where you got that, but that is just wild. Well, can I tell you something about my own journey with this thing? In um, March of 1985, Jim Jones was affiliated with the Disciples of Christ, an or, uh, uh, a denomination I had never heard of. All I knew that was that he left a lot of egg on this kind of mainstream denomination from Indianapolis, about 1.3 million members. Um, you know, an organization founded by Thomas Campbell and others, and, and um, you know, they do communion every week. They, they can just kind of mainstream, uh, a lot of different progressive, conservative, you know, got a lot of different people in, the, in this church. I, d I knew nothing about it. I gave a talk in um, March of 1985 to the Friends of the Library, and some guy raised his hand and I, I had talked about how Jones was still had standing with this church at the time of the, the Holocaust in, in um, Guyana. Raises his hand he says my name's Dick Busick and I'm the Disciples of Christ minister here in town and I want to take issue with something you said. So we argued about the point and came up afterwards and we argued a little bit more and thought this is a nice guy, reasonable, critical thinker. Two months later, we were looking for a church home in Albany. We've been going to the Congregational Church in Corvallis. And we, I said, let's go to that, let's try out that place with the guy that I argued with. And I'm a member there now. It's the only good thing Jim Jones ever did in my life. It was somehow indirectly, you know. And Dick Busick was um, the vice president of Northwest Christian College, just retired recently. Wonderful guy. And it's, and it's you know, that was a very hurtful experience for that church. They changed some things, the way they call ministers. Um, it, it, and I'm still exploring. I'm, I plan to go back to Indianapolis maybe in 2008 and meet the communications director for the church who archived all this stuff. 
uh, because he he took he he laid it all out, you know, and and they had to face up to you know the fact that this guy bamboozled everybody, everybody, all the politicians, all the churches, but it the but the blame rests, you know, you, you can say blame this person that person, it rests with Jones. Okay, People's Temple, what do you call it, social Christian, uh, uh, Christian socialism, wh whatever they wanted to be, they could have been that. They were, they were pointing in that direction. They had the money, they had the people, but it was fouled up. If, let's say Jim Jones it was, was on the up and up, they, they accomplish a lot. They, they see their vision, but the paranoia, you know, it's terrible. The CIA and the FBI weren't after them. The, you know, all these these things were they're coming to get us. You know, and you know if if they had, if, if they, they were just on the level, if he was just not mad, the place succeeds. It's probably still going. They probably have this wonderful agriculture. I'm probably going down and visiting grandchildren in, <coughs> or, or relatives in in um, Guyana. Well, uh, maybe on November 17th, 1978, a little more, if Leo Ryan had a few federal marshals with him, um, I, I don't know. But that, the, the question in terms of, a couple questions of where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line between a benign cult, perhaps, as one that that's becomes destructive or, or beyond that? And the second one is where does government intervention come in? Another one, which is, I always feel old, really old when I talk to a group of students, but the Branch Davidians uh, in Waco, uh, were another group uh, that was, the Branch Davidians have been around for a long time, but this particular group um, uh, was deemed cult and, and, and destructive and whatever, and the federal marshals were called in. And uh, it, it ended up in quite a uh, controversial uh, uh, episode in which uh, many of the, the leaders were killed and, and various other people were killed uh, in that. Even the white supremacists uh, that you get in northern Idaho and various places like that have had instances like that, which are almost cultish and so forth, and the federal marshals are called in uh, in those kinds of situations. Uh, it's really a tricky, <laughs> it's really a tricky question. But when when does a cult go bad in the utopian world, uh, which is I'm familiar with more? It's it's when does the utopia become a dystopia? When when is this notion of an idealness tur turn really bad? And Rosh Nishpuram is another great example here in Oregon, which uh, was in the, in the 80s when leaders and a spiritual leader um, who had, again, good ideas behind the beliefs and so forth, and a, and a mass of people came in, but all of a sudden they're, they're taking over the city council in Antelope, Oregon, rename of it, and then they're trying to uh, take over control of the, of the county government. They have a hit out on attorney general of the state of Oregon, who we, you probably should know. Uh, 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 and Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and various other things, but they did a lot of really good things too. But you know, where does the, where do you cross well, the cross the line? What you just said, that progression, 
What okay. they did in Antelope was disturbing to Antelope, but they did it legally. What they did in the Dalles was criminal. They put salmonella in the uh, salad bars, uh, and and they ne nearly I don't know if they I don't think they killed anybody, but there were a lot of very ill people, and um, you know the place just went bad and it was soured at the top. Right. The question is about children and their their choice or how they're brought into the cult is a difference between the mainstream religions and and the cults. Um, just just my quick response is that's a tough one too. I mean, there's not not a lot of these things about uh, uh, that aren't tough. Um, there are some groups who many people still look at cultish. Uh, the Amish uh, is a group that that can, people still can cult. Uh, in, in many respects because of the things that they do. Again, it's that notion of being different and, and having a separatism and so forth. They actually have a time when their their children are raised within the faith and the beliefs of, of that particular group, but then they have a time of going out and exploring or whatever, and what they're finding now is that a lot of the students, are not the students, but the young the young children, uh, adults and so forth, are, are not returning to the faith. Uh, but that's not very typical uh, uh, overall. I can... I can report on the Warren Jeffs group that uh, one of the things that, that he would do is if somebody was um, um, somewhat rebellious, uh, they would just kick him out of the group, which in some ways, then, well, why would they do that? But it made that those that remained uh, a little more cohesive. And so that's why he did it. And he was more likely, of course, to kick out the guys than he was the girls. In fact, there's a whole group of... Uh, boys down in southern Utah that were kicked out of sort of banded together. I think she's had her. Um, the question for Dr. Hester. Is that <coughs> it's good um, enough. <laughs> of, all of, the, of all the belief systems out there, um, my question to you is why do you, why do you keep um, pornography from kids like it's nice? Oh, wow. Now that's a great question. Um, I guess I'd have to say, first of all, I, I have to admit to you that I was born in the faith. My parents were not active. Um, I did attend. But there came a period of time in my life, um, this will hit home with all of you, I used to have a rock band. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, some of you may know that a rock band can sometimes have a negative influence on a basically good person. And um, that's kind of what it did for me. And I went through a period of time where not only did I doubt my faith, but I doubted any faith. And, uh, and then there was an incident that happened that caused me to start to say, wait a minute, I need to find out for myself. In my faith, uh, we believe that uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet like Moses or Elijah or any other prophet. And uh, one of the things that Joseph Smith did was he uh, was able to translate a book we call the Book of Mormon, which is a record of prophets who lived on the American continent and their dealings, uh, same God, uh, same uh, uh, doctrines. That Book of Mormon, we feel, is um, sort of the keystone of our faith. If that book is true, then Joseph Smith is a prophet. If that book is false, then Joseph Smith was a false prophet, and you shouldn't be a Mormon. So for us, it's read the Book of Mormon, pray about it, and uh, think about it, and then 
we believe that everyone will receive a spiritual confirmation of its truth. I received that, and uh, and uh, I guess I, I would say that I've had uh, did not things have not always been perfect, but about a year and a half later, I received another sort of witness that it was so, and I have I guess you'd say never turned my back since that point. So that's why. I made that as short as I could. I, I'm, I'm just going to follow up briefly. There's, I, I can't remember if this is on the website that Elizabeth put together, but there's, there's a, a website dealing with religious tolerance, and it, and it deals a lot with cult, uh, cults, um, and it calls them essentially new religious movements. But one of the questions is, uh, who are the true cults? Uh, and it says, in reality, the only crime of most cults is that they hold different religious beliefs from whoever is doing the attacking. For example, many conservative Christian counter-cult groups, and counter-cult groups are becoming a cult in themselves, which is, I mean, kind of gets kind of crazy there. Uh, but they consider the Church of Jesus Christ uh, of Latter-day Saints to be a cult that is tinged with Gnosticism and teaches beliefs which conflict with historic Christianity. Meanwhile, the LDS teaches that Christianity took a wrong turn in the second century of uh, the Common Era and abandoned most of the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. They regard their own denomination as the true Christian church. Who is the cult? <clears throat> and who is the mainline movement depends on one's viewpoint. I think that okay. sort of sums up some of these, some of these same issues. Uh, well, that was, um, may as well have been a follow-up to my question, but um, I'll, I'll just say it anyway. It seems like I mean, most of you guys are, are coming off as pretty religious, and so it would look like, um, I don't know about you. <laughs> um, but it, it, obviously you're gonna have a very um, biased view of, of cults versus religion. Um, and it, there doesn't seem to be a very clear distinction that anybody has really been able to present stuff so far. Um, I've heard that, that cults are maybe more violent or more malicious or malevolent. Um, uh, would it be that religions survive maybe because they're more mild in their beliefs or at least not as violent? Obviously, they're not going to survive if they go kill themselves. Um, but, but what is, I mean, and then you talk about, well, cults are, uh, they're abusive and they don't want anybody to uh, rationalize and think about their religion or think about their, their cult. Um, but I guess, I guess. I want to tie it into what <coughs> this guy over here said. Um, children of religion are brought up knowing nothing else. Um, they're told not to question. Um, I come from Utah. I'm very familiar with Mormons. Um, that's absolutely true no. in terms of Mormonism. Okay. Um, Mormons are actually encouraged to test and, and to try other faiths. So they're encouraged to go to other faiths. Uh, all of my children have been to other faiths. I don't know. Portland Mormons are exactly the same. If you ask them from the age of like four why that religion was the right one, because the Holy Spirit told us that this is the right one. They say that from the beginning. And so uh, I guess uh, I'm still asking the question, are you assuming that they were browbeaten into that and that this didn't happen? I, that they didn't have that spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, everybody has different spiritual experiences for different religions. I'm an atheist. Um, <laughs> in case anybody's wondering. Um, and so I, I, I want to tie into the question, and is, is there a clear distinction between a cult and a religion? Is it that, that cults that have just been able to survive long enough and accumulate enough members, so it's not looked at as, as weird or obscure anymore, then it becomes a religion? Um, do you do you see a difference at all, even being part of a religion? Um, and and why is a religion more valid than a cult? It's, I'll, I'll take a stab at part of it and and try to rephrase or not rephrase but repeat the question. Basically, you know, wh why did, is a cult a cult, and why is a religion a religion, and and when does one become the other, or vice versa, kind of kind of a situation? First of all, just just to to, to fill in the the. Uh, religious denominations here. I was raised a Roman Catholic in a very, very devout Roman Catholic family. Uh, I am no longer a practicing Roman Catholic. Uh, I still have the welts on my hands from the nuns hitting my wrist, I think, uh, in grade school. 
but uh, but I'm very spiritual, but but not in not in the organized church sort of way. Uh, but in response to the to the question um, or, or, or some of those issues, and now I'm going to use a utopian uh, community kind of thing. Most utopian communities don't last very long. Not too many of them commit suicide and do things like that. But they just they just basically human nature gets in the way, and they don't they don't last very long uh, um, overall. The ones that have been successful, and there are some, uh, I live in Aurora, Oregon, and Aurora is, is, had a communal group in the, in the 1900s that lasted 25 years uh, and, and was very successful. Uh, there's other ones like the Oneida community, even the Mormon church we include in my utopian circles as, as a utopian experiment that was very successful. And the reason that they do, even though they initially practice isolationism, I mean, there's a reason why uh, Brigham Young moved them out from uh, Illinois to, to Utah, uh, was to, was to separate themselves. There's another famous uh, community. Anybody from New York, the uh, Oneida community in New York, which John Humphrey Noyes. I mean, you talk about radical, strange things. They practice complex marriage. They believed that the Second Coming had happened in 72 A.D. and that we were living in the state of heaven already. And in the state of heaven, everyone can do basically anything. So they practiced what was called complex marriage. Everyone was married to everyone else. And this was a community that lasted from the 1840s until. Uh, he was basically chased into Canada finally in about 1877. Uh, but the things that, that made those groups successful and last for more than just two or three years is that they were became accepted into society. And, they, and many times it was almost economical. They had things that people would need. They practiced certain things that allowed people to, um, to use that. Oneida, the silverware that you buy at the stores today is the derivative of the Oneida community and, and, and things like that. In some ways, religion and, and cults kind of happen the same way. A cult can become accepted in some fashion. It may be the edges of it get a little bit refined, a little bit practiced. The, the abolition of, of um, um, where I'm looking for, in 1890, um, uh, plural yeah, plural marriage, you know, kind of redefined the church and so forth and allowed it to, to grow in, in, in that respect, too. So. It is, it is a gradual kind of a thing, and it's part of an acceptance, it's part of an understanding, part of the message that gets out there. You know, a, a, a cult with a, with, a, with a dark side of it is, is usually never going to get there, and, and, it, and it has leaders like J James uh, Jones that um, are destructive from the get-go, almost, in, in certain respects. I'll shut up. You can, see. can I just add one little thing? I think um, parents have not only the right but the responsibility to teach their children what their beliefs are. And I think um, a parent who doesn't do that uh, probably is not, mm, I don't know, I don't want to go there. But the point is, is that at some point, every individual will decide for themselves because you are not always going to be under the control of your parents. But at least as a parent, you give them that, that background. And hopefully, as they grow up and they go out into the world, they make their decisions themselves. And so I don't care whether you're a Catholic and you get your hand slapped uh, or whether you're a Latter-day Saint, whatever, at some point you come to your own. That's kind of your thesis is that we have our this reason and the ability to make those decisions. So because someone has been taught by their parents is not a bad thing. so that they have something on which to make that decision. Most people, most people who have faith believe it's true. So what if the children then from that? Right. But if the parents are telling you every day that the correct thing, then you just are you Are you saying that, you're saying that you'll never learn to think for yourself?
we're choosing based on your church, based on how we were their church to get to that point. I think, I think you're having your own business going yeah, that's right. right now. <laughs> and I think you can probably like figure this out like in yourself and let them believe what they believe. The question is completely relevant. Well, I think the question, I think you, I think you need another discussion it's session on parenting. Uh. I, mean, I, I, I don't, every family's different, you know. Uh, our kids can believe what they want. Uh, we will help, you, you know, we'll talk, we'll have those discussions around the dinner table. We'll, uh, nobody's, we're not browbeating them into, you know, so I, I, maybe you're seeing I'm sure there's some you're seeing from some perspectives, but I don't, don't speak for all families of how kids are, you know, forced to do this or that. Yeah, you, you use the term brainwashing. I think it's important to make a distinction between brainwashing, which could be some very real phenomenon. I mean, maybe that happens in some families, but training your children is not brainwashing because any parent who respects their children and loves their children wants them to grow up to be a mature adult with a mind of their own where they make a free responsible choice and they will encourage that they won't they won't stand in the way of that to bring this back on topic i guess part of the question you're asking is each family a cult yeah <coughs> <coughs> i let there's a few other questions here we've we've, we've reached the hour but uh yeah, he's, just, he's had his hand very patiently back there In, in my church, uh, excommunication is only done for a very serious sin, and, and it is not meant to kick anybody out permanently. Excommunication is an opportunity where the person and his ecclesiastical leader can then work to get themselves sort of back in, in um, um, I don't know what the right word is, to see if they really want to be a member of the church. Um, I personally, when I was a bishop, uh, uh, excommunicated two people, both of whom have since returned to the church. And that is more the norm uh, than otherwise. We don't, I mean, I used to work at a coffee shop, and I remember some religion there in Houston, Texas, they excommunicated somebody, and then they sent out papers. They passed out 400 letters saying, this person can never come back. We don't do that. That's not the same thing. Second of all, excommunication is we don't even tell people that someone has been excommunicated. So someone can be excommunicated and come in. I, I worked in the prison system. There was a young man joined the church when he was 19. He'd had seven different fathers, very abusive prior to that. He, he had a lot of anger issues and uh, he was excommunicated and told he could come back as soon as he'd paid his debt. Then he went off and murdered several more people. And I was really glad that he wasn't a member of our church because, boy, it would have been everywhere. You know, if, if nothing personal. But if he'd been a Catholic, no one would have cared. Whoever said that to them was wrong, I can tell you that, because uh, I talked with a young man who told me that last night. And so the first thing I did is grab hold of him and say, boy, I'd like to have you back right now. That's just, you know, in our church, we don't have a professional clergy. There's no paid ministry. So we don't have professionals. We have people who just have something in their heart they want to share they make mistakes probably more mistakes than some other faiths who have people you can train and 
expect certain things out of. Um, I certainly agree that some of our folks, some of our leaders have said and done things that are hurtful and harmful. Is that the norm? I not, that's not my experience. And I've worked uh, for 31 years in every position practically that there is in the church. Yes, I have seen a few of those, uh, but I work very hard to overcome the damage that is done by those. And frankly, I have to tell you also, sometimes people misinterpret what is said when they're hurting. And so I, I, I don't know what else I can say other than if you know somebody that feels that way, I'd be happy personally to make contact with them and try to get it right because if there's any way that I can to get them back, I would do whatever I can to help. We, I don't I'm looking at Kevin for guidance. I, I just more wanted to make a comment. I think um, looking at some of the interactions and discussions, um, I first want to appreciate the panelists, I think, in the audience. We're not sitting here having our different belief systems and, and things that we, we believe to be true being challenged, and I appreciate your willingness to answer questions that are, are challenging um, and, and definitely uh, pushing some boundaries. Um, I think that we all have our own systems of belief and our own understandings of things, and that comes from our own experiences and our teachings, and I think we're all going to be able to come up with experiences and ways to justify how, how we may feel about what your experience may be, um, and I appreciate and respect your experience and your willingness to be here. I think if we talk about the teaching of religion in the home, we also have to acknowledge that there are going to be other biases, whereas you may raise your families uh, with a certain belief. Um, and, you know, I also recognize when I went to school, you know, when I went to, to Sunday school as a child, it was, it was the church that my parents chose. I've since chosen a different system. Uh, when I went to school, the history that I learned was from a European perspective, very different than the history that other people may have experienced. Um, and there's a bias there as well. In any teaching, there's going to be a bias. And I think we all have to yeah. examine what is fact, what is personal experience, and what do we choose to resolve as, as what is meaningful for us and true for us. Um, so I appreciate that you've been willing to answer questions, some of which I think you know have, have really been targeting, uh, targeting some of you. And I appreciate your willingness to do that. I think that opens up the conversation and hopefully brings about a better understanding of each other, even if we agree to disagree. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's two different perspectives on religion. There are a lot of people, a lot of secular people would look at religion and basically their fundamental analysis of religion is that it's a story that religious people tell themselves that helps them get by, cope, feel better, gives them security, gives them safety, whatever, whatever it gives them. That's their, it's an artifact of their own imagination. Um, if that's true, then okay. Then, then religion would, and you'd expect it to change as the times change. My perspective is that, that there really is an objective truth. And uh, if, I, if, I, if I discover that what I believe today is not true, I'm out of there. I'm not interested in it if it's not true. It doesn't do anything for me if it's not true. So that's a very, very different take on religion, and you'll find you'll find people who have both perspectives, even toward their own religion. Occasionally, you'll, you'll see people who see their religion as not not really an objectively true thing, but it's something that works for them. Uh, other people, like me, 
see my commitment to the religion that I follow. I don't even call it a religion, but the faith that I call that I follow, I follow it because I don't think I have a choice. It's the truth, and I and I have to come to terms with it. There's another word to look at this, and I was going to use this uh, earlier too. Is is and it's a challenge to to each of you as students as 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 well as others is is that that whole thing of of critical thinking. Uh, it itself, because are you any more brainwashed as you were growing up in a faith as you are in college? Yeah. <coughs> uh, you know, what kind of brainwashing is going on here uh, in, in your, you know, whatever? You question it, always question it. And, and I think that's what will keep you sharp and, and everything else in terms of reaching your own faith, uh, knowledge, beliefs, whatever you want to want to call it. And, uh, you know, I think that's just a different perspective that you have to keep in mind throughout all this. Any last thoughts? We've gone over time, but appreciate your uh, attention and good questions. Thank you.